きまーわーおーオーダーはどんなことをしているのか、それは何のことをしているのか、それは何のことをしているのか、それは何のことをしているのか、それは何のことをしているのか、それは何のことをしているのか、それは何のことをしているのか、それは何のことをしているのか、それは何のことをしている
Luffy so interesting? What makes Luffy so interesting is he has traits that are dislikable. Luffy is impulsive. Luffy is aggressive. And the biggest one, Luffy is selfish. He's extremely selfish because when Luffy wants something, he gets something. You cannot tell Luffy no, or more like, Luffy will not take no as an answer. If Luffy wants to do something, he does it, since he's a man that works on pure instinct. But the reason Luffy isn't annoying and the reason his selfishness isn't a negative trait is because he's selfish in a selfless way. This guy is a walking oxymoron, and I will explain expand on that later, but for now just keep that in mind. Because there is genuinely so much to cover with Luffy, because he has endless scenes and endless points of interest, so I will be breaking this video up into parts and chapters. Maybe I should have done this with all the other straw hats, but here we are. Luffy is just such a beast, I have no other choice here. Before I really get into it though, it's sponsor time. This video is sponsored by Tokyo Treats and Sakura Ko. Sakura season is blooming in Japan, which means Sakura Treats for all. If you don't know what this is, Tokyo Treats is a monthly pop Japanese snack box where you will get up to 20 of the latest, most exclusive limited edition and seasonal flavored Japanese snacks. This time I've got the April box and it's full of delectable treats. These boxes are pretty big and very generous with their packing. My absolute favorite treats from this box were the premium Ghana chocolates and the strawberry Kit Kats. My stinky cat even agreed the Ghana chocolate looks so yummy scrummy. But everything was delicious. And next we have Sakura Ko, which is a monthly Japanese artesian snack box. Sakura Ko supports local Japanese snack makers with each box they send out, and they all come with 20 traditional authentic and artesian Japanese snacks, including Japanese teas and a special Japanese tableware. The tableware for this one was a beautiful cherry blossom glass, which I could not stop looking at. My favorite snacks for this box were the white chocolate strawberries, because these are honest to god my most loved Japanese sweet ever, and the Sakura Mochi. You can learn more about the snacks as well as allergen information from the booklets you receive, so it's tasty and safe for everyone. These boxes are well packaged and are packed with a lot of love, and I'm enjoying every single one I get. If you're a snack lover yourself, I highly encourage you to try these monthly snack boxes out and get your own little slice of the sweet side of Japan, all from the comfort of your own home. If you want to give it a try, don't forget to use my code to get $5 off your first box. Be sure to check the links below. And thank you so much Tokyo Treats and Sakura Ko for sponsoring this video. Alright, time to stretch out and analyze our beloved King of Pirates, Monkey D. Luffy. Hold on tight and take note, because this very well may be a never-ending ride. Something one may hear about Luffy, or one may think of Luffy, is what's there to talk about? Luffy is, on the surface, an exceedingly simple character. And while that's not untrue, I fully believe he's like Zoro in that way. Zoro is also a character who seems very simple on the surface. But deeper down, there's a lot more there that creates an actual character. Just like Zoro, Luffy is a simple guy, but he's not a simple character. There is no shame in being a simple guy, with straightforward goals and set ideas. And let me just say, do you know how hard it is to write a character like that and have them not be boring? Because Oda does indeed make these characters simple in mind and in life, but what builds them up is their struggles, their relationships, and their beginnings. All great characters have a beginning, and Luffy starts with an electrifying boom. For closer to canonical purposes, I'll talk about the manga specifically, but I am very fond of the anime's opening too. Both of these openings show how spontaneous and carefree Luffy is, one of them just focusing on his childhood more than his 
adulthood, teenhood, captainhood, I guess, whatever the current pirate part of his life is. And arguably the biggest part of his childhood, the biggest driving force of Luffy's character is Shanks. We all know it, it's no secret just how much Luffy admired Shanks, and just how doting Shanks was on this insane little kid. Why was Shanks so enamoured with Luffy? I don't know. I'm not here to talk about that. I'm of the opinion Shanks just saw Luffy as a very fun and strong-willed kid he thought was funny. But at the point of this video's release, we genuinely don't know his lore reasons, if any, for why he cared about Luffy. At that point in time, in these first pages, Shanks was hardly a character. We didn't know his ambitions, we didn't know his goals, and we didn't know anything about him. We didn't even know he was as as powerful and notorious as he was. But that didn't matter, because Shanks is not here for us to know Shanks. All we had to know is he was mild-tempered, he was carefree, and he was kind. Because that's what Luffy knew. Shanks is a driving presence of Luffy's character, although I'd call it more of a speeding presence considering just how detrimental Shanks is to Luffy. The mountain bandit bar scene teaches Luffy to only fight when there's a reason to fight, and to keep your head when a person is seemingly trying to start a fight. As Shanks said, needless killing doesn't make you a man. And if you have realized, one of One Piece's continuous themes is that Luffy doesn't actually kill people. He beats the shit out of them, but he doesn't touch them once they're down. I'm not saying Luffy hasn't killed people, but without Shanks's words here, Luffy would have turned into a very different pirate. Shanks's saving of Luffy's life from both the bandits and the sea monster is another core of Luffy's character, because this is an act Luffy one day wants to make up for. Luffy owes his life to Shanks and owes him back for the arm Shanks lost, something Luffy doesn't take lightly at all. This moment is where Luffy was taught to appreciate sacrifice when it's self-decided and self-acted for the people you love. As we know, Luffy is very aggressive and very stubborn in regards to those he cares about. Once he's decided he will help you, you He's helping you, no matter the cost. After all, he watched his mentor lose an arm for him, demonstrating the grit one needs to protect those they care about. So how can Luffy not become a terrifying force to reckon with if his loved ones are touched? But more than anything, this moment taught Luffy to appreciate life, especially the life saved by those protecting you. It's not just me theorizing this, it's even shown to us during the Baratier, when Luffy gets mad at Sanji throwing away his life to pay back Zeph, saving him years before. And when Luffy does get angry about this, what does he think about? He thinks about Shanks losing a limb, similar to Zeph, and how that saved Luffy's own life. The last thing Shanks taught Luffy came with the passing of the hat. This straw hat, and the passing of said hat, is iconic for a reason. Because this is the moment that not only completed Luffy's iconic look, but it's a scene that presents and cements one of the main themes of One Piece. This theme is the inheriting of wills and dreams, and the aspiration to make those dreams come true. Because what does Shanks say to Luffy? Keep this hat safe for me. Promise that you'll give it back to me someday, when you've become a great pirate. Shanks doesn't give him that hat until Luffy declares for the first time that he will become the King of the Pirates. Shanks is definitely the one that pushed this dream with his childish taunting, but with the passing of the hat we can definitely take it as a symbol of Shanks's faith in Luffy. This could very well be why Luffy starts crying, because amongst other reasons his mentor has just validated his dream 
dreams with something Shanks declares, in his own words, is very precious to him. And boy, did that hat hold a lot more meaning and history than we ever could have imagined. Shanks defines three permanent cores to Luffy that we still see very obviously to this day. The love for family slash crew, the will to chase dreams, and the freedom of pirates. And also, uh, food, I guess? If you want to count that as a core? Three cores plus food, let's go with that. In saying that, actually, I will get into why food is so important to Luffy's character, but I'll touch on that later. With these three cores established, the journey onwards is Luffy's challenge to keep these cores. That tends to be an established theme of character for the majority of the Straw Hats, such as Zoro's challenge to keep his loyalty and by extension his promises, and Sanji's challenge to keep his kindness and beliefs. If Luffy wants to keep his dreams, his family, and his freedom, he must face challenges. The conflict with Luffy doesn't usually come from within Luffy, but from outside sources. And this is how he grows. Because from what I've discovered, there's a misconception that Luffy hasn't developed as a character. And and we are not talking in strength or in power, we are talking in maturity as a person. I know us hardcore Luffy fans out there scream at the top of our lungs that this isn't the case, that he has matured. And listen, listen, listen my love, we're right. Luffy from the East Blue is indeed different from the Luffy we've seen in Wano. He's not entirely different though, and that's where people get caught up because I think everyone's expecting some dramatic change from a boy to a man. But he's not meant to be entirely different, because he's been able to keep his three essential cores. And most of all, he has kept his smile, which is where I think a lot of viewers get hung up on. Maturity does not mean you become jaded, or you become a scowling, angry adult, which is what Luffy is directly challenging. But I'll keep that in my back pocket until the end of this series and you should keep that in yours too. So let's jump back to the start and analyze what Luffy is like directly after Shanks. Because seeing him as a child is one thing, seeing him as a newly announced pirate is another. Luffy's introduction with Kobe, in my opinion, is the best way we could have ever gotten a quick and natural insight of his character. It shows us how inspiring Luffy is and how he pushes people around him. And also how he's kind of a dick by accident. My favourite line from him here is when Kobe is explaining why he can't run away from Alvida, and Luffy calls him dumb, gutless, and worthless all in the span of a single page. The anime makes it funnier when he just tells Kobe, wow, I hate you. Just shoot him dead at this point, Luffy. The poor boy has already been through so much. This is a recurring trait with Luffy, as anyone he meets who he deems a coward is someone he can't seem to stand. During Fishman Island, Shirahoshi was the person he said he hated. And it's very funny we have these two Kobe-like characters in both first arcs of each saga. It's almost like Oda's making a point about Luffy's character here. Luffy very much wears his heart on his sleeve, hence why he outright says the way he thinks and feels. Yet somehow, he's still endearing. And that's mostly because, even though he tells both Kobe and Shirahoshi he hates them, it's very clearly not from a place of malice. It comes from a place of frustration. Because both Kobe and Shirahoshi had dreams they wanted wanted to accomplish, but due to unfortunate events they've pushed their dreams aside and given up on their future, which is something Luffy cannot stand more than anything. As much as Luffy hates being restricted, he hates watching others restrict themselves due to their lack of will, because he wants them to live as large as he does, especially if they have a dream. Kobe's existence here is 
a showing of how influential Luffy is. Because after their meeting, Kobe finally stands up for himself against Alveda. Luffy honestly didn't do much apart from punch her out, but Kobe is the one who decided himself to finally stand up to her. Luffy's words of wanting to be the Pirate King, of giving his life to his dream, made Kobe realise what a coward he really is. This not only repeats itself with Shirahoshi, but it repeats itself with every single straw hat Luffy eventually meets and recruits. To put simply, Kobe's addition here is showing us that Luffy is so amazing of a person, and so inspiring of a person, that no matter who you are, how small you are, how weak you are, Luffy pushes you to want to be better. And he does this simply by existing, which again is an exceptional way to introduce Luffy as a pirate, and is a fantastic showing of why Luffy is undoubtedly the captain of his crew. And in speaking of his crew, I say we touch on them, because Luffy cannot be Luffy without the Straw Hats. Let's get one thing straight here. A crew to Luffy does not mean just a crew. It does not mean your standard pirates who have joined for the sake of joining. A crew to Luffy, as I'm sure we are all aware, means a family. Every One Piece fan in existence understands that Luffy uses the word Nakama for his crew. And we also all know there is no direct English translation for such a word, because it doesn't quite mean crew. It doesn't quite mean your standard family, but is instead a secret third thing that holds a double meaning in regards to who you use it on. This is why when you talk about pirate hierarchies and pirate positions, none of these apply to the Straw Hats. The only permanent and traditional position the Straw Hats have in regards to a hierarchy is the captain. Stop. Stop. Because I know what you're gonna say. But. Believe it or not, there is no official first mate. I know, okay? I was shocked too. But apart from Bartolomeo saying Zoro was the first mate, and other outsiders assuming Zoro is the first mate or captain, the crew themselves don't actually have one. Luffy never calls anyone the first mate. No one calls themselves the first mate. And Oda actually debunked that with an SBS semi-recently. I kept waiting for Zoro's little info card at the beginning of each chapter to change to first mate, but it stayed as swordsman. And then Oda made this cover art where he said, and I quote, Similar to Zoro, not all of those characters have the title of first mate. I was shocked, mainly because I thought first mate meant first to join, but that doesn't seem to be the case. Or maybe I'm just stupid, I don't know. Either way, I'm very open to someone on the crew, specifically Zoro, developing into the first mate. But for now, there's no such thing. Honestly, this is probably the biggest misconception Inception I've seen with Luffy and the Straw Hats. After my initial shock, my immediate thought was, but why don't the Straw Hats have a first mate? Is that not essential to a crew? The answer to that I've discovered is because that's not how Luffy works. And it would disrupt the trust he has in his crew to give any single crewmate a special label in regards to crew hierarchy. Because there's no first mate, there's no vice captain. There's just Captain Luffy and the Straw Hats, which is a great display of how Luffy sees his family. The Straw Hats are purposefully not meant to be like other crews, and having a first mate creates a power imbalance amongst the Straw Hats regarding who Luffy trusts the most that ruins the dynamic of them being a collective. Hell, early on there's even a page of Usopp telling Luffy he'll take command if Luffy 
waivers, and Luffy tells him that's fine. The Straw Hats essentially laugh at the strict hierarchy other crews put on themselves. Because otherwise, what's the difference between a marine ship and a pirate ship if you hand out vice captain labels and strictly stick to it. Luffy would never compare his crew in terms of putting his trust above or below anyone. That's not like Luffy, and that's not like the Straw Hats. The fact there's no first mate means Luffy completely trusts his crew to make their own decisions as a whole when he's not around. Which he does. Time and time again, he puts full faith in all of his crew no matter the situation. In fact, Luffy Luffy hardly commands his crew, and will naturally allow someone more knowledgeable of the situation to take over when necessary. Luffy is the solid ground the Straw Hats have found their home in. He's what connects them, and due to zero restraints regarding biases or different levels of trust in other crewmates, they've all been able to flourish around him. This is why, when Luffy chooses his crewmates, he very very clearly does not choose on ability, but through strength of person and soul. Because Luffy is not looking for a fantasy football team. He is looking for a family who he can love and who loves him back. He never saw Zoro fight before recruiting him. He never saw Nami navigate upon choosing her. And he didn't even taste Sanji's cooking when wanting him. There are some exceptions, of course, but with how Luffy is so recruit happy, it's very obvious he goes by vibes alone. In regards to Zoro, Luffy is originally interested in him because he hears the rumours from Kobe. Luffy is someone who decides for himself what to think, hence why he doesn't believe the rumours and takes an interest in Zoro before even meeting him. Once seeing him and talking to him and discovering Zoro's harsh attitude is essentially all bark, Luffy wants to recruit Zoro immediately. I explain I explained this much more in my Impact of Introduction video, but Luffy could see both Zoro's strong will and golden heart beneath the harsh surface. And it's why Luffy almost instantly took a liking to him. Zoro is very similar to Luffy when comparing the will to achieve a lifelong dream that is arguably stupid, and it's no wonder the two of them got along in seconds. In the same way Luffy laughed off giving his life to be the pirate king upon talking to Kobe, Zoro did the same thing when telling Sanji only he can call himself foolish when giving himself over to his dream. Off the bat, Luffy could see Zoro was fighting against the world no matter the odds, and Luffy loves that more than anything. Nami was similar due to using all the power she had to achieve her own dream, which was, at the time, to free her island. Nami was an incredibly witty and strong-willed person, and Luffy very quickly recruited her because, once again, he could see this aspect of Nami. When Luffy's decided Nami's his navigator, she's not only forever his navigator, but the best navigator, showing just how quickly and confidently Luffy trusts and loves a person once concluding they're part of his family. Luffy does the same with Sanji, and the Baratier arc is another showing of just how powerful of a person Luffy is. Zeph outright states Luffy is a person you never want to go up against, because his will and grit is unbeatable. Once someone like Luffy is your enemy, you have no chance of winning due to Luffy's ability to always get back up, no matter what. Luffy's determination pushed Sanji's own, in the same way Zoro's did as well. The Baratier arc was not just Sanji's arc, but an arc that showed how Luffy's big dreams cause everyone else to dream big too. Zoro pledges his life to Luffy in the same arc, while Sanji confesses his fantasy of the All Blue right after seeing the near impossible by both men. Because that's what Luffy does. Luffy reaches into your soul and yanks that childish whimsy right out of you. He's a stupid 
stupid guy, but that stupidity is infectious. And by god, if that doesn't make everyone around him want to shoot for the stars. Especially when this is a man who clearly refuses to leave you behind. Even if he has to tug and pull you into the stars with him. Either way, if you're with Luffy, you all fly with him. Which is what each Straw Hat recruitment never fails to show. Chopper is given a hope and promise that people will love him. Robin is given a family she can finally be herself with. Frankie is given acceptance of both him and his creations with his sailing ship. Brooke is given a music-loving captain who found a connection and second chance in Laboon. And Jinbei is given a man who he knows can help eventually break the prejudices and oppression of his people. Ah. But I didn't mention Usopp there, and that's because I have to add, if Luffy hates cowards, why is Usopp the exception? Simple, it's because he isn't a coward. <sighs> Usopp acts cowardly, he gets scared, but he faces his fears every day, and that isn't a coward. He's a self-proclaimed coward, but Usopp will do anything he can if it means protecting the people he loves. It may be through snot and tears, but it's a determination nonetheless. And that's exactly what Luffy can see. All Usopp wants is to be a brave pirate warrior of the sea, so Luffy reached out his hand to help him make that dream come true. Without the Straw Hats, Luffy would not be Luffy. Every single one of them holds an important place in his heart. And this crew has not been put in some weird pecking order. While strength does have a factor in it at times, it doesn't matter how weak or strong any of these guys are individually, because Luffy has made sure to always make up for it. And with his will to protect, every other Straw Hat feels that same passion and need to keep everyone safe. Also, in my opinion, the strongest captain or crew is not made up of big leagues you seek out. I think strength is made from what you love when putting your heart first. The reason Luffy has the strongest crew is because he can recruit anyone, and they will be safe so long as they're under his wing, and so long as he loves them and they love him. Strength comes from the heart, not from inauthentic ties of strong people just putting up with each other. This is why it's so interesting Blackbeard seems to be purposefully recruiting strong people he doesn't seem to get along with personally, because it's a direct contrast to how Luffy lives as a pirate. Either way, part of Luffy's strength and will to conquer 100% comes from his love for his family. He has grown in power and in person thanks to them, and they have all done the same back. It's why he will fight tooth and nail to make sure they're all safe. Because the loss of any straw hat that means the end for Luffy. It's just extremely fortunate Luffy seems to be a people person through and through, an aspect of his character that helped him gather these exceptional people, which is exactly what we'll be looking at next. is Luffy such a people person? It's natural. He has charisma, he has charm, the riz if you will, and he has a good sense for sniffing out the true purpose of a person hidden beneath layers of bullshit. This is probably thanks to Luffy's ability to say things how they are, to see how things are, and to cut to the chase no matter what. Once again, he wears his heart on his sleeve, and it's very hard to lie to a person like that. Even Buggy and Mr. Three found it difficult to do so. The two of them crying whenever Luffy showed them genuine smiles of appreciation will always make me laugh. Luffy is extremely good at reading people because he is an exceedingly simple person. He doesn't double think on anyone's meanings. And for master manipulators like 
let's say Doflamingo, <laughs> this gummy gummy guy is their kryptonite. Because what the hell are you gonna do against someone who works on pure instinct when you work on the insecurity and indecisiveness of others? There are no games with Luffy, just straight up vibes. Something I've learnt in my constant re-readings and re-watchings of One Piece through the years is to always trust Luffy, especially when it comes to character. He was right about Robin being a nice person, he was right about Law not betraying them, and he was right about every single selection of his own crew. It's kind of hard to go against those numbers when the bull is always in Luffy's court in terms of relations. But how does this help Luffy? While he can read people, is he able to use it for important gain? The answer quite simply is yes, even if it comes with some struggles from time to time. The issue with Luffy is when he decides something, he's decided it. Like I said, he mainly works on instinct. But this isn't an animal instinct of kill or be killed. This is an instinct of what he wants to do because he thinks it's the right thing to do, no matter what anyone else says. And that's where his selfless selfishness comes into play. For example, the situation with Hachi and the Celestial Dragons. Luffy promised Hachi he would not cause a scene, and he would not touch a Celestial Dragon. But Luffy couldn't stand it. In front of him, he's seeing his friend who has been shot, and he's being told to do nothing. This promise in itself was not for Hachi's protection, but for the protection of Luffy. Essentially, Hachi doesn't want Luffy to get hurt for him, but Luffy doesn't care. So let's look at this simply the way Luffy would. The punching of this celestial dragon, by all means, was a selfish act on Luffy's behalf, because he broke the promise made with Hachi. But once again, it's selfless selfishness. Luffy is not fighting simply to fight here. He's not breaking the promise due to any malicious thoughts. It's simply due to the fact Luffy cannot, and will not, put up with the restriction placed on himself and others. He will not stand for the hurt of others, especially if the person causing the pain believes to be untouchable. Luffy does not believe in titles, he does not believe in classes, and he does not believe in looking down on or looking up at anyone. Luffy is not seeing a celestial dragon as a celestial dragon. He is seeing this guy as an obnoxious asshole. So of course, Luffy is going to punch the shit out of him. This is a solid trait Luffy holds, and it follows him all the way to Wano. An extremely similar scene in comparison to Hachi's own is when Luffy goes to punch Kaido for the first time. In the same way Hachi told Luffy not to cause a scene, Law told Luffy not to touch Kaido. But what does Luffy see? He sees Kaido going all out on a helpless village, because he believes them to have stepped out of line under his iron fist. Law's begging Luffy not to start a fight now, and by all means, Luffy does try his best to follow Law's plan. When it comes to Luffy, he does actually try to follow plans. Despite popular belief, he does does listen to Law when he can. Even if he doesn't understand it, he'll follow along when need be. The thing is, a lot of the time, these plans do tend to involve a great bit of sacrifice to keep the Straw Hats and crew safe, so long as they don't get discovered. And Luffy refuses to accept meaningless sacrifice, especially when it's not chosen and when it's forced upon an individual. Just just like Sabodi, Luffy's anger overwhelms him upon watching Kaido take out lives, so he ignores Law and jumps forward. Is this immaturity? Is it immature to see hundreds of people dying and deciding to try and do something about it, when you can just 
run away. I wouldn't call that immature, especially since feeling anger in that moment is extremely warranted. Luffy greatly cares about people. His instinct is to protect. His heart tells him to do something about it, so he does. Sabote to Wano is not an example of how Luffy hasn't matured. This is an example that Luffy has core principles and has a big heart, and that will not change. Once again, maturity does not mean you become jaded or you stop caring. There's a big difference between zero development and keeping the core of a character. Something I do want to touch on in this section is how Luffy's heart and his reading of people has evolved over time. As I explained in my VV video, Luffy is very good at understanding emotion and person. Sometimes he just doesn't know how to navigate it. VV specifically has taught him that a quick, violent solution isn't always the answer. Sometimes the best thing you can do is bow your head and show your compassion. Because no one is above an apology, and no one is above bowing their head. If a princess to a possible future queen can do it, so can the future pirate king. Which Luffy has embodied from her and has carried. From his complication with Hancock, all the way to Bonnie in Egghead. The best way to understand his evolution of emotional intelligence is by analysing the two times a member of the crew has tried to leave. Usopp in Water 7 and Sanji during Whole Cake Island. Water 7 can be a tough one to discuss, considering the way you see the situation. I think Luffy was correct in retiring the Mary for the safety of the crew and for the Mary itself, but he was was totally wrong in how he handled it. It's one thing to make a decision in a tough situation, it's another thing to reveal your decision to others in such a situation, especially when the decision in question affects everyone. Luffy understood Usopp's sorrow in giving up the Mary, but he didn't understand Usopp's anger, mainly because Luffy didn't actually understand Usopp's turmoil of himself at that moment moment. Usopp even admits later on to Frankie that he knows the Mary cannot survive any further travels. But after losing the money needed for the ship, and after Usopp had tried to fix the Mary countless times, and the fact Usopp had a personal connection to the Mary, Luffy's delivery of such a decision came cold and hard, with no consideration for Usopp. Luffy only escalated the situation. He he chose to fight Usopp, to the point Sanji had to kick Luffy into shape due to just how much damage Luffy was causing, mentally, to his own crewmate. This by all means was a total moment of immaturity on Luffy's part, and is probably why Zoro didn't even flinch when Luffy was kicked into shape. Unfortunately, the moment Luffy chose to apologise was too late, because it felt inauthentic. It was essentially a mum yelling at their kid to say sorry, honestly. Not exactly that, but you get the point. I know a question here would be, well, wasn't Usopp being immature? You could say Usopp's own outburst was immature, but we have to remember he wasn't looking for a fight. He was in a moment of total distress. Luffy is the captain, and he learnt what it means to be the captain in this moment. If Luffy hadn't escalated this situation, it's very possible a fight would not have started, and his tears at the end are caused by his own lapse of judgement and immaturity. It's why Zoro tells him to keep his head and to stand strong. This is what Luffy has chosen. This is what Luffy has caused. And he cannot waver, lest he causes the crew as a whole to waver. Once again, Luffy was right about the Mary, which Usopp also knew, but his management of it showed what a boy he was. A captain, at least a good captain, does not just navigate physical matters, but matters of the heart as well. With Usopp, Luffy understood that his simplicity of ways can be a negative, and being a captain takes more than a strong punch. So with that in mind, 
let's jump to Whole Cake Island. I truly believe you'd have to be crazy to say Luffy has not developed or matured as a character when Whole Cake Island is right there. The situation with Sanji was not the same, but it was similar to Usopp's. Sanji's situation was a personal matter, a pure matter of heart, and Luffy understood how to maneuver it this time. Most importantly, he understood not to escalate. It. In Water 7, what Usopp needed was to be assured he is part of the crew. Usopp needed validation from Luffy that no one is replaceable on the Straw Hats, and Luffy didn't give him that. If anything, he made it worse by picking a fight. And again, who kicked him when Luffy told Usopp he can just leave? Sanji. And what is Sanji majorly struggling with in Whole Cake Island? His sense of worth, especially his sense of permanence amongst the Straw Hats. Sanji, like Usopp, starts a fight. In the exact same way as Usopp, Sanji didn't want to fight. He's made it clear for Luffy to stay away, that he's made his decision. But what does Luffy do? Do. He stands his ground, and he looks Sanji right in the eye while doing it. It's important to note Sanji did hesitate, but Luffy's taken a fair few kicks before he sees the hesitance. Luffy's not all out brawling with Sanji, because he's showing Sanji, with his actions, that he values him enough to not further escalate the situation. Sanji can do what he wants, but Luffy will not waver not in the same way he did with Usopp. We are watching the difference in maturity for Luffy here. We are no longer seeing a boy, but a man who knows how to be a captain to his crew. He knows what Sanji needs. He's grown to understand his family further within two years. And even though he doesn't understand Sanji's reasons, he understands Sanji. It's in the same way he understood Usopp, but couldn't understand understand his anger. And what does Luffy yell when Sanji's turned his back on him? When he's miserable in the carriage and is leaving his captain behind. <laughs> I can't become the Pirate King without you. This is an extremely powerful line. And again, it's a showing of Luffy's maturity. Because it's a showing that Luffy understands point blank what Sanji needed wasn't a fight. It was assurance and support. Because just imagine how Usopp would have felt had Luffy told that to him, instead of telling Usopp to leave if he was so unhappy. Luffy's made that mistake once. He's not making that again. In fact, he's so confident in his decisions and actions that he doesn't shed a single tear during this moment. An act of pure determination and faith in his love for his crew. The total opposite reaction we saw back in Water 7 when clearly feeling remorse for what he'd done to Usopp. This. 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 This is development. This is development of heart, of character, of Luffy's instinct to do what he believes is right. It's just crazy to refuse that this is development. I can confidently say if pre-Water 7 Luffy had to handle the Whole Cake Island situation, it would be a total mess. Luffy learns to navigate the heart. He learns to trust. He learns to wait. His impulsiveness can help in the majority of life-threatening situations, but not in emotional complications. And he knows this now. I just think comparing Water 7 to Whole Cake Island is a beautiful example of Luffy's growth. And it does make me sad that Usopp didn't get the love needed at the time. But we must live and learn somehow. And it's reassuring to know Luffy will not make that mistake with Usopp or anyone again. Before I jump to the next section, there is something I want to bring up. Nami. Why does Luffy keep falling asleep during Nami's backstory? Simple. 
It's because Nami doesn't want pity. She doesn't want people to save her simply because they feel bad for her. Nami doesn't want tears shed for her. She doesn't want her pain relived for the sake of compassion. And understanding her past can make a person feel obligated to want to help her. With how strong of a person she is, and how scarred Nami is in regards to trusting people and relying on people, Luffy knowing nothing about her past or the situation of her island was a total comfort for her. She even told Luffy he knew nothing, that he had nothing to do with the island, and she still asked for help, giving us another powerful, famous scene. Luffy yelling, of course. Nami knows full well Luffy is doing this because he wants to, because she's his family, and not through pitying a sad girl. Luffy knew Nami's trust was fragile, that she was fearful of sacrifice in her name, so he refused to learn a damn thing to help her understand this is what a crew does. They help each other and care for each other no matter the reason. And when she asks for help, he yells of course, even though he doesn't know anything about anything. Is that not the most compassionate thing a person could ever do for you? I don't know why we're swinging hands, but we're swinging hands. I know it's a joke that the Straw Hats don't ask questions about each other, that no one seems to know anything about anyone's past. Past, but I believe that is very purposeful. Luffy doesn't tend to say anything unless he's asked, and neither does anyone else. Because Luffy has made sure to create a home where your past does not shape you. Luffy doesn't need to know Nami was held captive for eight years. He doesn't need to know Sanji was abused by his blood father. He doesn't need to know Frankie worked with Tom or the adventures Brooke had with his former crew, or even about Zoro and Koina. This does not come from a place of uncaringness, but an understanding that that's the past. What Luffy cares about, what matters to him, is the present and the future. He will listen if the past is presented to him, as he did with Hancock and the Boa sisters, but it's not of dire importance. Luffy does not view the past as a secret, he views it as a thing that exists. If anyone on the crew wants to tell it, they will, but there's no obligation, because the Straw Hats are about who you are now, not who you were then. As most of the crew are victims of a horrendous past, this would surely be total comfort for them, and one of the reasons why they follow Luffy. Sorry, that may have been a bit off track, but since we have talked about Luffy's heart and how he's matured, I say we talk about Luffy's own past, especially with how he, like anyone, can break. But I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, I have to stop it there. I know I'm blue balling all of you in the most terrible way, it's just my computer cannot handle an over edited over one hour long video. I do think it's better this way though because there is so much more to talk about with Luffy, so I will let you guys settle with everything said in part one. Please do not worry, the script is fully written, it's just a matter of recording and editing it. Part two will be up as soon as possible, and the beast that is Luffy will have finally been defeated. Through this time, I'd like to thank you guys for sticking it out, and I'd like to thank my patrons for the support they're giving me. For now, comment what you're most interested in, or if anything here has itched your brain with Luffy. Loose ends will be tied up for part two, and I encourage all of you to use those big noggins and form your own opinions and interpretations of scenes I've just analyzed. Until then, I will see all of you in part two. Thank you for your patience and hold on tight. See ya!